This country is an old hag who's given itself to anyone and everyone who's come along. Brits, Germans, French, and now she's lying here, blood dry, burned down, and totally fucked up. I don't think there's any oil there at all. It's a lost cause, if you ask me. Uh, welcome, my name is Yuta Kanuril. I am clearly not an actor. That's uh, good news <laughs> for this evening. Um, <laughs> I'm the program coordinator here at the Goethe Institute. But this is how it started. I, I read Swiss playwright Lukas Berfuss's play Brühl in German. And we were working on our programming focus, uh, City and Climate, which this year we center around our big exhibition and, uh, and other programming around post oil city up at every Brickworks um, to the end of July. Go see it, we just wrangled it ironically from the Dawn River flooding uh, and saved it. Um, but after all, I'm an arts programmer, so for this cluster, I wanted to find aesthetic expressions um, of that post oil question, whatever that is. How will we live in the future? future cities and what will it feel like, um, which is also why I inserted sort of a, a little film program into this exhibition and why we're here this evening. Uh, a bit of background, together with our friends uh, from the Swiss Consulate of Pro Helvetia, I think it was 2007, uh, that we brought Lukas Berfus actually over from Zurich. Uh, he is one of the, I dare say, top five, maybe top ten uh, German language playwrights. He did a brilliant uh, text for tropes, some of you uh, will remember this, um, and a reading of the bus with theater smash at the Terminal Theater. Thank you, Richard Rose. Uh, when I think of Lucas Berfus, now the very next person I think of in Toronto is one of the theater's uh, director, actor Philip Christie, um, who I can't quite put my finger on it, but he has this, maybe he can better than I, he has this affinity with Lucas' work and his style and, and this particular kind of humor. So we're all laughing the last two days here at the Goethe, so we're very hopeful. It's going to be entertaining. Uh, Philip himself, I hope you saw that start in uh, Canadian stage production of Berfus is the Test. Uh, was that last year? Last two years, two years ago. Maybe. Yeah, two years ago. Uh, so he's well versed in uh, all things Berfus. And then, <clears throat> by chance, or call it uh, maybe curatorial fate, I came across um, Douglas Copeland's Episodic Text Player One, which I had never heard of. <laughs> it's based on his uh, messy lectures, set in a big airport. I don't know, I immediately saw myself at Pearson um, at, I guess, the brink of disaster in more than one ways, uh, environmentally, economically, and, and mentally, in some cases. Um, so I asked Philip to relate these two texts. Uh, if you will, post oil treatments, one European, one European perspective, one a North American perspective, to each other in this double bill, and here we are, uh, with a cast, uh, ladies first, uh, <laughs> Alex Paxton Beasley, Pamela Sinha, Tony Napo, and Tim Walker. It is a frankly makes me weep that we will only put on this one reading. Uh, but thank you people for bringing them. Uh, so enjoy, and at the end, we will have a chance to talk to the artistic team about what they've done here the last two days, and some of the workshop situation. Uh, and I guess I'm over just to fill up to frame it a bit more. Thanks. Thank you, Yusa. Um, thanks for coming. We weren't sure if anyone was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, yeah, we were setting it up and we were like, well, do they have to wait outside first? Like, how long can we have the room? And we were like, it's only going to be Yusa anyway, so she can wait in her office. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. Um, you to kind of explain kind of the genesis on her end, and one day I just got an email from her. She asked me to uh, if I'd be interested in directing a reading of excerpts from these two pieces. So just to give you a bit of context so that you, you aren't completely confused when we start, uh, what we've done is uh, we've the first part will be we've taken three excerpts from Douglas Copeland's Player One which is a novel, a five-hour novel, so, you know, choosing excerpts from that can be difficult to choose three that actually might give you all the information that you need, but hopefully we've, we've tried to, to do it in a way that hopefully it's self-explanatory and you're not completely lost, but we, there'll be three excerpts from that, and then we'll switch over and we'll do an excerpt from Lucas Berfus's play, Oil. 
And just so that you guys know, we have taken some artistic license with the scripts in terms of paring them down. We've done internal cutting and stuff, so they aren't pristine excerpts from the book or the play. I hope that it, the reading inspires you to go find these pieces and, and find the, the rest of them, because uh, I really fell in love with them when I first read them, and it was really, really difficult to, to pare it down to, to my favorite parts. These aren't the same. But anyway, um, as you said, hopefully, so we'll do the reading of Player One, we'll do a reading of an excerpt from Oil, and then afterwards, if you are inspired to, we will have a conversation about Oil, Greed, and the End of the World. Is that how you... Is that disaster, how you, yeah. And disaster. <laughs> Not a question and answer, though, a conversation. So you have to participate in the conversation if you want to, but we will stay and do that with you. Um, Anyway, I hope that it's self-explanatory enough, and uh, enjoy it, and if you have any questions afterwards, as we said, we'll be good. An excerpt of Player One, a novel by Douglas Copley. The Delta Chelsea Lounge, near the airport, happy hour. This is Karen. Karen's internet day is lurching sideways, quickly and catastrophically. She's frozen by the discrepancy between Warren's internet JPEG, slightly <laughs> game show hosty with a whiff of Old Spice, <laughs> and his actual appearance, phantom roostery, <laughs> with a pair of aviator glasses that make him resemble a repeat sex offender. <laughs> and then there is the instant over-familiarity when Warren places his slightly moist hand on her thigh. <laughs> Followed by another over-familiarity of... Hey there, sunshine. I'm Warren. <laughs> Warren, her highly anticipated date, is wearing the bland politician smile of someone who knows that the bodies in the car trunk are, indeed, dead. <laughs> Karen tries painting a happy face on this encounter, but almost against her will, she is becoming a disembodied specter floating above the meat version of herself, watching Warren order a scotch and soda, then comment to her, How about this lounge, huh? Everyone here looks like they're about to enter a witness relocation program. To this, Karen says, with a preachy tone in her voice that she has never liked in herself and that comes from nowhere. Oh, please. Everyone knows that the witness relocation program is a hoax. A uh, hoax? How? The FBI simply shoots the person and buries the body if it's a family. They shoot the whole family and bury the bodies. The fact that you never hear from them again perversely proves the success of the program. Uh, Warren says. I like that. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Karen, perversely, begins to wonder whether she is out of Warren's league or if he is out of hers. <laughs> she wonders if Warren looks like the sort of man who would borrow your car and return it to you with several dents and no explanation. <laughs> and on its seats would be a stain all the club soda on earth would be useless against. <laughs> Karen has the woozy, regretfully sick morning after sensation that she has when she's been eBaying while drunk the night before. <laughs> what have I done? Flying halfway across a continental landmass to meet a man I've only known electronically for two weeks and only visually from one brazenly fraudulent JPEG. <laughs> Karen attempts humor. Looks like um, we've hit the awkward patch. Warren says, The awkward patch usually happens a bit later. Then catches himself, <laughs> saying, It's not like this is something I do all the time. How many times have you done this? Warren's pupils clench like sphincters. I'm just messing with you, sunshine. Sunshine? Where is that coming from? Warren's scotch arrives. He holds up his glass, forestalling further discussion, then says with a lewd smirk, To us. <laughs> to us? <laughs> <laughs> Warren is mentally betting Karen, and while almost everyone wants to be thought of as sexy, 
Karen realizes that the empowered sexiness she felt on the plane was merely a manifestation of her new role as loser bait. <laughs> Suddenly, the bartender's attractiveness has risen considerably. <laughs> she feels embarrassed being with Warren, as though she had accidentally sat at the wrong lunch table in high school. Warren asks, How was your flight? <laughs> Fun. Lovely. The two begin reading the news crawl on the TV screen. Karen realizes that the encounter isn't going to be a story with a happy ending, or even an unhappy ending. It's simply going to be one more event in her life that becomes a dot on a wall that won't connect with any other dots to form a line with any beauty or meaning. She feels like she's in a Discovery Channel clip showing wildebeests in a watering hole. The voiceover is telling viewers that wildebeests' lives don't have to have stories the way people's lives do. Wildebeests only have to exist. They're lucky things. And they've done a good job of being alive on Earth, as does pretty much everything on the planet, save for human beings. <laughs> on the TV screen are three people in a flooded Midwest town, sitting on their roof having a barbecue and smiling as they wave to passing newscopters. Karen feels a wash of jealousy. Change entered the lives of these people unbidden. Change never happens in her own life. And while she'd gladly change her life herself, she has no idea in what way to change it. She feels like a taxidermied version of herself. How quickly time passes. And how your mistakes add up one day to something less than what you wanted. Warren, does your life ever feel like a story? Warren's body freezes. A story? No. Yes. I don't know, I think so. Why? <laughs> Why? I feel like the story part of my life is over. Karen had hoped a cocktail lounge would disinhibit her, make her more truthful in a randy way. She hoped that openness would turn into intimacy, that truth would lead to closeness. But instead, the cocktail lounge is making her crabby as her repressed ideas and thoughts percolate to the surface. Warren orders a second scotch, <laughs> and watches a news clip about a small meteorite strike in Scotland. <laughs> Karen thinks about her daughter Casey, age 15, walking into the kitchen last month saying, On December 4th, in the year 65,370,112, a meteorite will strike the earth and all life will be killed. It makes Karen dizzy to think about the year 65,370,112. And yet that year will arrive as surely and relentlessly as the bi-weekly shopping flyers that clutter her front porch. Casey described the next Ice Age to Karen as having Ice so thick and heavy it will puncture the Earth's crust, generating molten blisters of nickel and bauxite and pitch blend. When that happens, the oceans will turn to steam. Life will end. <laughs> the news shifts to a story about cancer. <laughs> Karen uses this opportunity to tell Warren, You know, you've had cancer countless times in your life, except when your body got rid of the condition, you never even knew you had cancer. What we call cancer is actually a term for the cancers that stick around. You don't say. Interesting, huh? Karen knows her cancer fun fact would probably have <laughs> sounded much better if it was read off a screen inside an email. Spoken in real life, it makes her sound like a church lady. Life is so often a question of tone. What you hear inside your head versus what people end up reading or hearing from your mouth. Karen also hates her tendency to turn into a Jeopardy game when she's nervous, and yet she begins prattling away. And colds and flus are basically nature's way of training your body to fight cancer. You know the old maxim, never sick a day in your life, and then one day, pow, people prone to colds and flus live longer. It's a fact. Warren is quickly drifting away into TV land. And at that point, it isn't like Karen wants Warren to stick around, but if he's going to be leaving, Karen wants the exit to be on her terms. She needs just that easiest bit of control so she can emerge emotionally intact from this random situation. She hammers the final nail into the coffin of her internet date. Warren, if you were a contestant on Jeopardy, what would your six favorite categories be? <laughs> Under his breath, Warren mutters, Jesus H. Christ, are you a talker or what? <laughs> Karen's life may well not be a story. She knows this now. 
It feels odd for Karen to be a person without a story, like so many other people out there now left marooned at a certain age without a narrative engine to pull them through their days. In the old days, she could have at least adopted a role within the community. The divorcee cautionary tale. The tough old broad who... She doesn't even know. But the tough old broad who makes birdhouses out of license plates? The tough old broad who fills X number of years until her death, doing nothing of consequence until science... Genetics. Nutrition. And life decisions collectively fail and take her to her inevitable end. Karen sat on her bar stool, watching Warren clad in his repeat sex offender eyewear, watching the bar's TV. Maybe he wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> A part of Karen was suddenly disgusted by the part of her that was oddly turned on by the part of Warren's personality that was actually kind of base and mean and sexy. The part of him that had charmed and seduced her into a cocktail lounge 2,500 kilometers away from home. Online, he was such a charmer. Karen had thought he would touch her body gently and methodically, his body that needs some hands on it quickly, as though he were at the bank counting a stack of twenties. <laughs> Warren's hands were rubbing the rim of his highball glass. The bartender appeared and, to her surprise, handed Karen her second drink of the afternoon. Warren asked, Feeling better? and oddly, she was. And that was the point when Warren yelled out, Jesus, H. Christ, oil just went up to 250 a barrel. <laughs> Warren and Karen were transfixed, watching a CP24 newscaster interrupt regular news to show images of OPEC leaders fleeing a Sao Paulo hotel dining room after a large explosion of some sort. The news crawl beneath it reported light crude oil listing on the Dow at $251.16 US a barrel. Warren said to Karen, Is that for real? Holy shit, just like they said. The bartender looked at Karen and asked with genuine amazement, They? Who's they? Karen said, Actually, it's just this uh, one guy named uh, uh, Hubbard. The bartender asked, Who's Hubbard? Warren said, Dr. Marion King Hubbard was a Shell oil geologist who predicted in 1956 that U.S. domestic oil production would peak around 1970 and that global production would peak around 2000. And Warren continued. That production peak is called Hubbard's Peak, and it looks like it's finally happened. As an aside, Karen said, The 1970s oil shock set his calendar back by a decade, but he was right. How on earth do you people know this? It's kind of weird. Karen said. We met in, um, this is so embarrassing, a, a, a peak oil apocalypse chat room. <laughs> Man. Warren said. Wouldn't Hubbard freak to see oil over 250 a barrel? The bartender said. You mean you two actually did meet in a peak oil apocalypse chat room? Warren said. <laughs> yeah, so what? There are a lot of collapsitarians out there like me. Karen, slightly embarrassed, added. I was in a dark patch. I think doom and gloom sites. We all do that sometimes. Got there enough. Look! Warren shouted. Look at the crawl. Oil just hit 290 a barrel. And then the bar's power went out. <laughs> Just long enough for everyone to think. Good night. And then the power returned, but the TV's cable connection was dead. End of scene. Delta Chelsea Lounge, near the airport, happy hour. This is Luke. This morning, Luke drove to the bank and withdrew his church's savings and went to the airport to catch the first flight he could get to a big city, which happened to be Toronto, where he now sits with a crazy robot woman supermodel. On his bar stool, his pockets brimming with cash, Luke feels as though he radiates darkness as surely as the sun radiates light. Luke still believes that we are all, at every moment of our lives, equally on the brink of all sins, except that now, in a world without faith, sin has no ramifications. It's just something humans do. Luke sits with the 
flawlessly beautiful, Rachel. The TV screen shows the remains of a Florida zoo recently pummeled by a hurricane. Luke feels old and lost. He felt lost when he was young, too, but back then he felt lost in his own special way. Now he feels lost in the same way that everybody else does. Luke turns to Rachel and asks, Have you uh, ever had a vision? I don't understand your question, Luke. A vision? A, a picture in your mind that's not real life, but it's not a dream either? It's something that you see, that you know is true, and you know is going to happen. Have you? Once. Last summer. I had this vision. I fell to my knees and I saw a wash of light. And then I saw a fleet of dazzling metal spaceships, like bullets aimed at the sun. And I wanted to walk towards them and get inside one and leave everything behind. And I had a vision. The only vision I've ever had, and it told me nothing. It offered no comfort, no guidance. Were the spaceships built by humans or by aliens? I thought of that. Uh, humans, I suppose. He looks at the gorgeous but unreadable Rachel. Do you believe in aliens? I think that all subatomic particles are designed specifically to generate life the first moment they possibly can. In our case, it happens to be based on DNA. On other planets, other designs will have occurred, perhaps stacked rings or some other linear structure. Scientists now believe that life started on Earth not just once, but many times, until it continued to become the forms we currently experience. Even if you took a planet full of nitrous sludge and did everything to hinder life's development, it would still evolve. Rachel pauses. Actually, Luke, sometimes I do see pictures in my head when I'm working in the garage and have been over-concentrating in bright light. They don't make any sense, but I do see them. I once had this vision that a mountainside collapsed and buried me. While I watched it start to fall down, I wasn't at all frightened. I knew that the weight of the soil and rocks would make me feel safe and protected. Luke's pupils dilated upon hearing of Rachel's visions. Something she had said had emotionally affected him. Does your vision mean anything, you think? No. Perhaps only that I had curry for dinner and its effect on my stomach is psychoactive. <laughs> but the landslide dream did make me stop worrying about death. Luke looked at her face closely. Maybe someday you may become a poet. I don't understand poetry. Well, that doesn't surprise me. But you have probably other things going for you. Yeah, I can tell. Luke polishes off what remains in his glass and size. Rachel, I, I wish everything would just end. I think I've had just about as much of this world as I'm able to take. I'm pooped. Is that what people call a cry for help? Should I notify a local suicide hotline of your intentions? No, Jesus. Have another sip of your drink. Rick passes by and Rachel looks at Rick and says, did you know that every single human being on Earth is related to a single woman who existed 160 years ago in the place now commonly known as France? Seriously? <laughs> Said Rick. <laughs> related to every person on Earth? Yes. Man, she must have been one total slut. <laughs> <laughs> Luke almost chokes on his scotch, but then manages to swallow it and bursts out laughing. <laughs> Rick heads off to the back of the bar. Rachel looks confused. She asks Luke, What's wrong with being a slut? I would think society would welcome fertile women fully enthusiastic about reproducing with a wide variety of genes so as to propagate the species in a genetically healthy and sensible manner. Luke looks at Rachel. That's certainly one way of viewing things. Luke, are you single or married? Luke says, I'm single. But doesn't know if this is the right answer if he's going to make it with Rachel. <laughs> being single is a self-fulfilling situation. Why are you single? Something must be wrong. I'll pass, thank you. It's slightly easier for single men than for single women, but it sets out an awkward signal nevertheless. Single means lonely. And lonely is scary, as Luke knows all too well from years of counseling his flock. Luke is lonely too, but only when he thinks about time and growing old alone. Luke is afraid of getting hurt, but he also knows that if too much time passes, you miss out on the opportunity to be hurt by other people. To a younger Luke, this sounded like luck. To an older Luke, this sounds like a quiet tragedy. Luke asks, What about you? Are you single? Yes. 
irregularities in the insula, cingulate, and inferior frontal parts of the brain make me unable to have what neurotypical people such as you call a relationship. <laughs> I enjoy situations that are familiar to me, and if that means having a person around, then that's fine. But it's not something that I crave or seek. I also have 630 people following my ongoing blog on the subject of mouse breeding. <laughs> One might consider them, if not partners, then friends. They constitute my community. Don't say. But this may change. The brain grows 10,000 new cells every day of its life, but unless you use them, they dissolve back into your brain. Serves them right. Says you. Okay, Rachel. Then what do you crave or seek from life and life? I would like to become impregnated by an alpha male so that I can prove to my father that I am in fact human and not a monster or alien. <laughs> <laughs> Let me buy you another drink. <laughs> and then oil hits $250 a barrel. Even Rachel's ears perk up at that news. She tells Luke. That means that a tank of gas for the typical North American made sedan will cost about $300. Luke remembers driving to the airport to catch his flight to freedom. The gas at the pumps back home was a buck and a half per liter. Would they even be open now? Just then, the power goes out. When it returns, ten seconds later, the TV is white, fuzzy snow. End of scene. Many things will happen next. And these things will happen quickly because time does flood and time also burns. And during this burning flood, Karen, will know the world has changed for good. She will sit with Luke and she will think about her daughter Casey and her family and she will know that something far greater than 9-11 has occurred. The entire world has now turned into the Twin Towers and it will never feel normal ever again. And that in itself will be the new normal. And somehow Karen will be at peace with this. But not for now, for other things must happen and they must happen quickly. Time speeds up, time speeds down, always time, always rattling our cages, taunting us with our never-ending awareness of its presence, our only weapon against time being our free will and our belief that life is sacred and our hope that we have souls. Luke will survey the remains of the day strewn about the lounge as he does. He'll be unsure what to do. I'm no longer convinced. Soul. Then Luke will get paranoid, he will wonder if God is using him, then he will think, Well, faith or not, in the end we are still judged by our deeds, not our wishes. We are the sum of our decisions, and with decisions so often comes sorrow. Luke accepts Karen's hand, a hand that cares, a hand that can mold his inner life, a hand that will touch his face and make him see the truth. With her, he will realize that everyone on earth is damaged goods, and that is the wonder of it all. That is, this is when Rachel will have a vision. It won't be a dream or a hallucination. It will be a <clears throat> real vision, more real than real, actually as clear and bright and dust-free as an online second world. And the vision will be this. Rachel will be crawling through the empty streeted remain of the suburb <coughs> in which she grew up. It will be the middle of the day, but suddenly the sky will go black, but not eclipse black. Rather, as it occurred in the candlelit bar, the optical sensation will be more as if the sun had simply gone out, and yet the sun will still be above, yet it will be casting no light, and not even like a full moon. The big black sun will be shining down in the middle of the night, and beneath this dead sun, Rachel will see cars stopped in mid-journey. Their drivers gone. The front doors of homes will be open, and she knows that were she to walk into these houses, meals would be sitting on the table, some still warm, yet there will be, never be people coming back to eat them. Some TV sets might still be on, yet were she to change the channels, all the scenes would be devoid of people. The sitcom living rooms, the football stadiums, and the six o'clock news stations. Nobody there. And amid this switched off landscape, Rachel will find herself breathing hard, and blood will be pounding within her head, and she will be shouting to anybody who will listen. Awake, 
Awake, I've come to bear good news. Anyone who can listen, awake, awaken. Our time has come. You are thirsty, you are starving, and you ache to rebuild from the ashes of the present. And my news is this. Hallelujah, we are ready to enter the third testament. Our time has come. Now we move onward. Fiction and reality have married. What we have made now exceeds what we are. Now is the time to erase the souls we damaged as we crawled down the 20th century's plastic radiant way. Listen to me. We will soon be reborn. Heed my words, I beg you, as now my vision is coming to an end. Awake. Awake. End of excerpt from player one. Mm -hmm.